Hi, Corey Eubanks. Welcome to Stunt Stories. A few years back, I got to do a show called Starsky and Hutch, feature film, not a TV show, feature film. Ben Stiller, Owen Wilson, and I was hired by a good friend of mine named Gary Davis, who is the stunt coordinator, to uh, stunt double Ben Stiller for this film, to drive the Grand Torino. And had a lot of fun on this movie. But it was one of those films that just things were going wrong and unexplained things and bizarre things would happen that would go wrong. For an example, <laughs> we had this one day downtown Los Angeles. We had a first unit and we had a second unit. And Gary Davis was going off with the second unit to shoot Greg Fitzpatrick jumping off of a building. And so then I was left with the first unit to do a driving sequence down this alleyway. Now, the car that I was going to drive, this Grand Torino, we had, I believe, three of them, three or four. I think four if we include the jump, the one that I jumped at the end of the movie. Um, and the first assistant director wanted me to come down this street, slide the corner, come down an alleyway toward camera. Now, Halfway down the alleyway, there was a crane, and as the crane was going to boom up, they wanted me to go underneath lens. Now, I'd never driven this car before, and they wanted to do a rehearsal. And I said, you know what, I think it's best that I do a half-speed rehearsal because I've never driven this car. He's like, okay, fine, Corey, do a half-speed rehearsal. So coming down the street, I even thought to myself, it's probably not a good idea to hit the emergency brake to pitch this car because I've never tested it. It's one of the things you want to do. You want to test a vehicle before you go taking it past the crew or trying to do a shot with it. You want to test the vehicle first in a safe environment and see if it works. Had not done that. Had not been given the opportunity. So I thought this first time driving this car, I'm not going to do it. So I just drove the corner. And I'm coming down the, the alleyway. And halfway down the alleyway, approaching the crane that's going to boom up, there's a manhole cover. It's very bumpy. If you've ever driven down those alleyways downtown LA, they're not the smoothest surface on the face of the earth, I'll tell you that. They're a little bit bumpy. So I'm driving down the alleyway, and I hit this manhole cover. And I could just tell by the feeling of holding that wheel, as soon as I went over that manhole cover, it just, I go, I've got no steering. It's like the steering wheel just became just loose. And I thought, okay, I've got no, and so the car felt like it was wandering. I said, this isn't safe. I'm not gonna take this car underneath the camera. So I went to engage the all fours, the foot brake, and just the front right caliper was biting. So the vehicle pulled pretty aggressively to the right as I started steering down on my left. It just a freewheeling. There was nothing. It was just disconnected. And it pushed into a garage door, the, the car did, and it buckled the garage door and stuffed me right into a brick wall. Now, not knowing that there was a brick wall on the other side of the garage door, I wasn't even bracing myself. So the car, I was probably traveling at maybe maybe 20, 20 miles an hour between 17 and 20 miles per hour. And to hit a brick wall unexpectedly, not bracing yourself, going 17 to 20 miles an hour, sure whips your head forward awfully violently. And my head went forward and my mouth went right into the steering wheel and shoved my teeth, my lower teeth, through my lip and blood's just gushing from my face. And one of the first people to me was Todd Phillips, the director, and to ask me if I was okay. And I just remember looking up at him and I was holding my, my mouth and I took the steering wheel with my finger and I spun it and it just spun, 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 spun. And I said, the steering went out. So, the first AD looked at me and saw that it was, and the medic came in, and, oh my gosh, you got to go to the hospital and get stitched up, which I did. Went and I got four stitches on the inside, and I got four stitches on the outside. But what was funny is how this story um, evolved. 
And the next thing I know, I'm hearing the next, the following week on set is that, oh yeah, did you hear what happened? No, what happened? Oh yeah, I heard Corey couldn't handle the horsepower of the car and he lost control and, it, and he crashed it into a wall. Now, the stunt business, a lot of things go wrong. But uh, a lot of things are not the stunt performer's fault. And I am one of those that if it's my fault, I'm the first to raise my hand and say, hey, it was my fault. I screwed up. But if it's not my fault, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fight you on it. I'm going to fight you on it. I'm going to say, hey, no, that was not my fault. And that's a situation that something that happened on set. Uh, I went to the hospital. The vehicle was totaled. Totally not my fault, but I really had no proof because they're like, well, it's busted and we can't tell what happened. So now we fast forward many, many years. I'm sitting on a, on a set in Detroit working on Transformers 5. And this one friend of mine who's a mechanic working on the film with me out of the blue says to me, you know why your steering came apart, don't you, on Starsky and Hutch? And I looked at him, I said, well, that was random. Wow, no, I don't know why. How did it come apart? He said, I inspected the vehicle. He goes, if you remember, I was the mechanic on the show. And once they pulled the vehicle aside, he goes, I dug through there and there's a shaft that comes in from the steering column through the wall that goes in and there's two pieces and, and the tube goes inside this other uh, pipe fitting and there's supposed to be a pin and a bolt. He says, there wasn't. It was just sitting inside there. So when you went over the manhole cover, it slid out because it flexed and set down alongside it because they didn't put a pin in there. And I started thinking to myself, hmm, that's right. The very first day that they brought out this Gran Torino to show us, we were at Hollywood Park and I was going to teach Ben Stiller to do some stunt driving. And they brought out this Gran Torino and they popped open the hood and we went to look at the engine and it's just all chromed out. I mean, everything was chrome, just bling bling everywhere. And I thought to myself, oh, there must be some scene in, in, in the movie where he lifts up the hood of the car to show this incredible engine. because. There was, there was thousands of dollars worth of chrome and it was just beautiful, all for nothing, money wasted. They never lifted up the hood to show the engine. So all of that work that was done to the engine was for nothing. So then he goes to start the engine to show us how it sounds so we could hear it and wow, it's impressive and this gentleman's in there and he's revving the engine and all of a sudden, it makes this weird sound like something just started hitting and binding and grinding and he shut it off and he got out and he looked at it and he's like, oh, we didn't put the engine bolts into the engine mounts. I'm like, oh, wow, that's probably not a good thing. You guys should maybe take care of that. <laughs> so that was one thing that went wrong in the show. I ended up going to the hospital and then there was another time I was asked to do a reverse 180 into a forward 180 coming right up to a police car where Owen Wilson, Todd Phillips, and Gary Davis now are standing. And Gary Davis told me, he goes, I want you to come in close enough that I can reach out and just touch your car. I said, okay, um, you guys want to step out of the way and I'll come in there and do it. He goes, no, no, no. I want to show Todd Phillips, the director, and Owen Wilson, the one of the stars of the movie, how safe it is, how accurate you can be. I hadn't even slid this car yet. And I was just like, oh my gosh, this is not a comfortable situation. So I thought, okay, come in very conservatively. And I came in and I hit the emergency brake, pitched the vehicle and just started to get around sideways and jumped on all fours and slid it right up. And I was like, my heart's just pounding through my shirt and Gary Davis reaches out and touches the vehicle. This is perfect. So they set cameras. I end up doing this four times, coming down the street, throwing the 180 right up 
alongside Owen Wilson so he could be close enough to touch the car and he walks around to take a look at it and gets into the passenger seat. And I remember after one of the takes, I went over and I talked to Todd Phillips to look at playback on the video and I said, so did that work for you? He goes, yeah, 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 then maybe we'll just do one more. And I said, well, you know what, Todd, eventually uh, I'm going to hit him. And he looked at me and I said, yeah, eventually I'm going to screw up and I'm going to smash him right up against that car. And he goes, oh, well, okay, then let's print, let's move on. So we moved on. So now I got to come in backwards and throw a reverse 180 into the forward 180 to match what we just shot of me coming up to Owen Wilson. But now the two maneuvers I'm doing are taking me to my right. If you're driving backwards and you crank down on the right, the vehicle wants to, the chassis wants to pivot away. I need to go that direction toward the curb. But this maneuver I'm doing, cranking down on the right, takes me away from the direction I want to go. Then to throw the 180, you got to turn down on the left which again, the vehicle is, is going traveling away from the direction that you want to go. So the two maneuvers that I have to do to pitch this reverse 180 into the full are, are spinning, you know, say, say counterclockwise. I need to be spinning clockwise. And I remember I said to Gary Davis, I said, Gary, can I maybe go the other direction? He's like, no, 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 Corey. It's just like throwing a, a curve ball. And I'm thinking to myself, I don't even play baseball, so how am I supposed to identify with this analogy of throwing a curveball? Didn't make sense to me. But anyway, I got back and I came in fast, backwards fast, and I whipped it and I got it around and I could almost get it into a, the, the 180, but I couldn't quite, and I tried it a second take and I whipped it around and I whipped it and I almost got it. I'm like, gosh, I need to go faster. Now, Jimmy Roberts is standing there now doubling Owen Wilson because I'm coming in fast. And I remember saying to Jimmy, I said, Jimmy, be ready to bail, buddy, because I'm, I'm coming in fast this time. And, I, and if I overshoot it, I want you to jump out of the way because I don't want to smash you into this police car. Now, there's another police car parked along the side of the, of the curb. And every time I'm going backwards, I'm just passing this police car, this being the police car, and whipping it to throw the 180, reverse 180 into the forward 180. Now I'm going to come in faster, and I'm going to do this hook, throw this curveball, hook baseball thing. And I come in hauling ass backwards, and I, I'm like, okay, I'm going much faster. I better, I better whip it sooner. So I crank the wheel, and the front end of my Gran Torino clips the front of the police car, bam, and just rips off the whole front end of my car, just demolishes the front end of the Gran Torino, and it just skids to a stop. And I remember just, I just went, oh, F word, like that. And my good friend Maurice McGuire was operating this long lens. And his shot was just featuring the front of the vehicle. Matter of fact, when I crashed into the police car, from his camera angle, you couldn't even see me. But then he pans over and he tilts up so he could see my frustration and my anger in myself. And I was like, you got to be kidding me. Todd Phillips ended up putting that shot in the outtakes of the movie. I went to the premiere down in Hollywood, sitting there watching the end credits, and I'm like, no, you've got to be kidding me. Seriously? They put my screw up in the outtakes of the movie? Do you know what kind of text messages you get from your fellow stuntmen when they see your screw ups in the, in the outtakes of a movie? It's unbelievable. It's ruthless. <laughs> it's, it's also, it's also very funny, but, but ruthless and cruel and insensitive. <laughs> it's, it's like, ah, oh my gosh. So, when I, you know, you got to kind of like, just take it easy on yourself and go, okay, don't let your ego be too damaged by all of that. But yeah, it was, it was quite an experience working on that Starsky and Hutch movie. Oh my gosh. And you know what? I, I got to sit down with uh, 
uh, a very good friend of mine named Charlie Paterni Sr. And when we were at Fast House, and I got to interview him for stunt stories. And it's funny because as we were talking even off camera, I was like, wow, Charlie, you, you did a television show called Starsky and Hutch. And then I did a movie called Starsky and Hutch where we both doubled the same character, not the same actor, but the same character. He did the TV show, I did the movie. Then later on, I do the movie Lethal Weapon. No, excuse me, he did the movie Lethal Weapon and I did the TV show Lethal Weapon. So it just, it just swapped. But anyway, I got to sit down with Charlie Petrini Sr. This man's resume is 300 films deep. It's it just incredible what this man has accomplished in, in his career. Anyway, check out what he has to say. Unbelievable story. Thank you. But you said that, you said that about Andy and Steve, too. Well, I say because it's on a card over here and I got to read it. No, come on. You know I mean it from my heart. I know. You, you, are a, you are a hard act for anyone to follow. You have this career that is so lengthy. I was going through your IMDb list. Too I'm like, long. you got to be kidding me. How uh, old is that guy? And, <laughs> and, and I'm like, <laughs> normally for the show, I'll, I'll take a, a, a whiteboard with a little Sharpie and put some notes off camera so I could glance over and read through the... No, I couldn't do that with you. Mm -hmm. I had to print out... Oh, these 25 oh pages <laughs> to write a book that start back in 1961. Whoa. The you Untouchables. About, you talk about The Untouchables, that was a movie. I did the original series. Series, The Untouchables. You also did uh, The great sh Greatest Show on Earth. First color TV show. Was it really? 1963, Jack Balance, yeah. What about one of my favorite shows, The Big Valley? Well, then that was Vince Stedrick, yeah. That's a lot of Vince stories about that one, yeah. Senior. Senior, yeah. You've worked on the original Green Hornet. Bruce Lee did four fights with him. You got to do a fight with Bruce Lee? Four. Who Two. in this room can say they did a fight with Bruce Lee? <laughs> 200. They did. Two. There were two on Enter the Dragon, one on the Green Hornet, and then he did a thing uh, called uh, uh, forget, Bat well, Batman. It was four fights I did. Did you study any kind of martial arts? No, but I know a lot about it. I work with every martial arts guy in the business. I did boxing when I was younger, not like you. And by the way, Jeremy Brown says hello. Oh my gosh. Okay. <laughs> Good guy. Uh, but I know a lot about it. I know how to put it together and hire the right guys. And the main thing about, I just did a little boxing movie, is knowing about it and how to film it. Because a lot of the guys that I, that you, even the young boxers that are very good, this kid Sam Horowitz is terrific, and the people like that. Uh, you got to show the camera, it's so important, how to film it. That's the most important thing. So, you know. You know, I... I, I know all you know, the martial Benny Akiti's and the, I can go on and on with the martial arts guys that I work with. I've, I've been fortunate enough to work uh, on productions with you when you were the first unit director and to watch you were... I remember <laughs> you and I, we did a show <laughs> called Hollywood Beat. <laughs> I'll never forget it. We're walking down this alleyway <laughs> with John Moyo, and you pulled up on the set in this convertible Rolls Royce. <laughs> and I'm like, I want to be him <laughs> someday. You remember it was that? Fun, yeah. The Rolls Royce? I remember, I remember Joel Silver when I did Lethal Weapon 2, or 3. I had bought a Ferrari, a Testarossa, in 91, I think. And we're walking on the set with Joel and his old entourage, and he sees my car in the parking lot. He says, Whose car is that? I said, mine, you bought that on Lethal Weapon 2, remember? <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Oh my gosh, yeah, you mentioned Batman, uh, Mod Squad. Does that bring back any memories of any? Yeah, I got a scar right here from a fight <laughs> I did. <laughs> no, I mean, I did 27 years of television, my first 20 yeah, years this, of business. Yeah, this show called Mission Impossible? Mm -hmm, my first car hit, 25 where, miles an hour. Where you got hit by the car. I got hit. You, have I mentioned how tough you are? You are a very tough, tough man. Torah, Torah, Torah. Remember that movie? Does first, that... first Air Ram. First Air, invented First Air That's Ram. what I was going to say. Back then, the, Joe that, Finnegan invented that. And back then, if I'm not mistaken, those Air Rams were just like, poof, instantaneous. Now, 
right now. No, guys, just like a big three by three foot box with an air a tank in it. And the shot was Benny Dobbins, I don't know you guys will never know him, Benny Dobbins or myself and Joe Finnegan who invented the air ram. It was a shot on the uh, aircraft carrier in uh, Hickam Air Force Base, right on the, where, they, where they had uh, World War II. And we dug the air rams in the deck of the ship and big scene, Japanese fighters coming over and talk. I felt like I was in the war. I mean, it was unbelievable. And it was 40 gallons of gas blowing up in back of us. We we're running towards the air ram. As we hit the air ram, the ga gallons of gas go off. Now we got to go about maybe 20 feet over the rail. And as we go down in the ocean, there's a dynamite coming up. Oh my gosh. So I was just, I never was an air ram guy, but I was hitting it pretty good that day. And uh, Eric, uh, I forget the coordinator's name now. He picked me and Benny and Joe naturally had, it was his air ram. So I just focused on that thing, man. I just hit it and I just felt myself going up. I'm coming down. I see the dynamite coming up. Everything worked out good. Benny kind of tripped and went over, but it, it, it all worked. Uh, I was, Victor, Victor Paul, my good friend, had an Instamatic camera on the dock taking a picture. And I was like that, and Joe Finnegan's like that. Oh, wow. <laughs> How old were you back then, when you, do you think? You are in your 20s? None of your business. No, I was, uh, I was, uh, <laughs> You were 14? I was 30, <laughs> about 30, 30 years old, something like that. Wow. How but about was, uh, American Graffiti? American, American graffiti. graffiti. Yep. There's a, you Guys, back American memories. Graffiti is a classic. American Graffiti, I was, uh, I was doing a thing here called the FBI. And I had to fly, it was Friday night, and I had to fly up Saturday morning early because I had a cornfield, a shot in a cornfield that, uh, what's the name, Lucas? That he had a direct. Yeah. And He's made a couple of Right, he made a couple. Anyway, a spaceship it was two cars racing down a highway, and one blows up and goes in a cornfield. So it was a sunrise shot, it was very important, and we got up there and we did that. American Graffiti. American Graffiti. I forgot about that one. Yeah, you mentioned Enter the Dragon, <laughs> the rookies. The rookies. Well, I did Aaron, a lot of Aaron Spelling. That's where I got my break directing through Aaron Spelling. When I did Starsky and Hutch. For the rookies I worked on, Charlie's Angels. Well, and, you also directed for Stephen J. Cannell because I did a pipe ramp for you on a Hunter episode. That's right. I did. I did eight shows for Cannell. I was very nervous because I knew I had to try to impress you. You did. Did I? And Debbie, you and Debbie Evans impressed me too. <laughs> yeah. She's the, oh. besides you, Debbie frightens me a little bit. Yeah, but that's just because she's so talented. You know when you get in back of a camera <laughs> and, and when you're driving and you look at the camera crew and you start driving towards them, you're going to make a slide and you see everybody going like this. Yeah. Going like that. Well, I'm behind the camera directing Debbie. Debbie. She's coming out of the Griffith Park Tunnel and I'm behind the camera and she's coming and she, she could have done it 10 times, but she's coming at the camera and I had to back out. <laughs> That's how close she came. So she's amazing. She's just an amazing woman. You worked on Earthquake, the streets of San Francisco. <laughs> Why are you naming all these kids? These don't, are, they don't know these I, shows. Come on. <laughs> well, first of all, we all have to know that people watching this show are watching it from all over the world of all, all demographics and all ages. I mean, these, the streets, McLeod, these were classic. McLeod, I did a fall off a freight train. Me and Howard Curtis, who died doing a free fall later on in life, we had to fall off a freight train about 20 miles an hour with an airbag. Watching it come and then go off, you know, one of those. That's one of those But stunts. I remember every show you mentioned, I, I picture something that I did yeah, on it. It's amazing. Something. My memory is still there. <laughs> but, but Charlie, that, that stunt you just mentioned, they wouldn't do that the way today, the way you did it back then. I mean, if you no. overshot, if your timing he was He did, off, by the way. He, he overshot, just hit the end of the bag. I hit it right on. Fortunately, but he missed it a little bit. So it's a tricky shot because you're doing a fight and you got to wait. You look at the pad, you're hitting move back and forth. Now you got to go. And you got to go like 30 feet before the bag. Otherwise, you're uh, going to miss it. I did that with Joe Irigoyen, who was Joe Finnegan's father. I'll wow. tell you a little story about that if you got time. Yes, this is all about you. We're doing a thing called Evil Roy Slade up in uh, Bell Ranch, the insert road, if you remember that years ago. And I was doubling an actor named John Aston. And I'm on top of the stagecoach with eight up. And Billy, uh, little, uh, Billy Curtis, a little midget, is on my back. He's supposed to be grabbing me as a comedy thing. Well, this time we had a dummy on me. And Joe is driving the eight up. I couldn't drive it. He's blind driving. He's got a little hole like that. And so I'm up there and he said, look, kid, here's what you do. And he put a stake in the road. Now, the stake in the road is 100 yards away. I'm <laughs> way back. He said, you hit that stake, you go right off. Go, when you hit that. He's looking at me, he's a tough old bastard. The camera... You're calling someone a tough old yeah, bastard. He the, must the have camera, been tough. He was tough. Oh yeah, he was a tough <laughs> cowboy, man. And the camera was 
probably 30 feet from the stake. I said, what is he talking about? I'm going to listen to him anyway. I don't care. Because <laughs> I don't know. And he's up there. All I hear is, yeah! And the horse's ears go back. And wah, wah! <laughs> and I'm up there faking the horses, you know. And these horses, and I'm looking at that stake, and it's coming closer and closer. And I go, yeah! And I kick out. And it was a dirt, a big dirt bank about 25 feet down. I hit that thing and rolled and rolled. And I got up. And there's a camera. He knew what he was talking about. Went like that. <laughs> he gave you the little wink. You no, know, those guys know you got to listen. When, you, when you're young and you're learning, you got to listen. You know, Observation, true. learn, watch, look. It's better than film school. All you guys, you're on a set, don't talk about your stunts. Stay near the camera. Watch what they're saying. Listen to all the director, the actors, the wardrobe people. Put a double on that. Put a single on that. Put, watch everything. It'll help you later on. Because you're not going to do stunts all your life. Like Louis. Franco. <laughs> yeah. You know, you want to coordinate, you want to second, you want to direct. Look, I, I started directing and I'm still, I wrote a script, I want to direct my own, my own film. I went to acting school for three years, Beverly Hills Playhouse, to learn how to work with actors and do scenes, direct them and also act in them. So it helps you going up. Now, did you play a part on Happy Days? <laughs> you did, didn't you? <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Speaking of acting. Part, but I, I did. Did you play a part on Emergency? Yeah. 90 feet up, they carried me off the building. And Police Story. Yeah. Well, I said I did 27 yeah. years of TV. And the Bionic Woman and Kojak in Dallas. Bionic Woman with the woman, yeah. And Kojak. Y you and I have something in common, but not really. We, we both worked on a, a show at different times called Starsky and Hutch. We doubled the same character. Well, you did the feature, different actors. and I did the series. We were trying to copycat you, and we failed. No, you didn't. <laughs> but we tried. <laughs> you had a better car. <laughs> well, you know, I remember I had Gary McClarty, the first episode of Starsky and Hutch. He was chasing, I was chasing him, and he had a 67 uh, Chevy. I got it all set up, the engine, everything was over, the chocks and everything, and Gary was happy with it. And he was a hell of a driver. When he was on, nobody could beat him. When he was off... Because he was a little nuts, he, he was off. Yeah. But when he was on, he was amazing. I didn't touch the Torino because I figured it's brand new. I'm not a mechanic. I'm not a race car guy like, like where is he? That Steve guy. Holliday. <laughs> <laughs> but I know about cars. I did enough. And I didn't do anything to it. And it just it took about two blocks to get up to 50 miles an hour. Because it had a 310 rear end in it. So the guy said put a bigger rear end in it. And then from that point on, zero to 50, it just flew. And, but the first show, I couldn't catch Gary, and he was flying. But he was amazing. He was an amazing guy. I met so many different guys in this business that were amazing. And he was one of them. Bobby, I can go on and on. Bobby Orison, Dick Bullock, you guys don't know. Oh, my know. gosh. I know Bob. You know, I, Bob Orison lived just right down the road from me. I worked with him on Bobby, Dukes of Hazard. great guys they were. Oh, he was they were a great, awesome great talent. guys. No bullshit. Excuse me. You could say no that. No bullshit about them. Yeah, we could use bad words. They were just terrific guys. Have you ever guys. swore before? Sometimes. <laughs> Only at my two sons. <laughs> Nancy will smack me in the mouth. How was it working on the Rockford Files? The Rockford Files was fun. I scared the actress on that. The lead actress, I forget her name. But I was playing a heavy and I'm chasing her through this warehouse and there's all mirrors and stuff all around. And she sees me and she sees me. She's all over. And I'm looking at her. And she couldn't sit down next to me. She, oh, I frightened her. <laughs> you were pretty intense. I can remember back, like even on Roadhouse. Well, yeah. You were pretty intense. You've mellowed a little bit. I have? A little bit. Get the camera. Roll the camera and watch what happens. <laughs> yeah. But you know, Roadhouse, that's another thing. Roadhouse, with all this stuff. People tell me when I did this little boxing movie, and then a lot of guys call me, nice guys, and they said, you want me to help you choreograph? Well, I, every show I've done, I've stunt coordinator, I've done underwater stuff. Uh, aerial stuff, fights, I always coordinate my own stuff because I know about it. I know what I'm doing. I know how to film it. I know about it. And I hire the guys that are good for it, whether it be boxing or underwater or whatever it may be. And you put it together. That's what a stunt coordinator right. is. And you do it very, very and now well. Now I watch it and I see, and it's no problem, I, 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 but I, I never do it. Every, every stunt coordinator has a fight coordinator. Fight choreographer guy. Now yeah. I know that these shows are big. Like some of the shows that Andy does, you got different units all over the world so you got to have them but a lot of these things i'm talking about a tv show fight coordinator i know you do it all well, things have changed it. 
Things have changed. They though. have, and I can tell you about that too. <laughs> um, you know, what, you know what, it's funny too is if we think back of so many films that you've done or TV shows that then they try, oh, that was such a successful show that you worked on. It had a lot to do with the creativity and how it, the outcome. It's another point, creativity. Go ahead. I'm, I'm and then those, th because of the success of those shows, they then make movies. Charlie's Angels. You worked on the series Charlie's Angels. I worked on it. I did coordinate it, but I, I did a lot of parts on it. You know what Andy was saying before, and I could relate to Andy so much, and Steve, and what they were saying. And I've been in be, a little before them. But Andy, uh, just one quick note. Uh, he's talking about Planet of the Apes. I worked on the original Planet of the Apes. Mm -hmm. But Andy's saying how him and Charlie Crowell created this stuff. And I'm thinking, I did a thing on Facebook about Meryl Streep, who was a fantastic actress. Don't, nothing take away from her. But she made a thing about creative art. Only we are the creative arts, the actors. Oh, I remember, remember this. Remember that? And I did yes. a thing on Facebook and I said, bullshit, whatever <clears throat> I said. Yes. Well, what do we do? What did Andy do on, on Planet of the Apes? What did I do on Die Hard 2 when I went out without any storyboards and I created, I created Your imagination. this stuff. Yeah. You That's an art. This stuff. Is that an art? Absolutely. Is what he it did is. with Planet yes. of the Apes, an, is that an art? It is an art. Then why don't they see that? So right now, what we're doing, just so you guys know, with the, because I'm in the Academy for, like Jack Gilford, 91, 25 years or whatever. We're trying to get more people. More people is more, more strength. So if we get 100 members in there that have, and we're bringing the criteria down from 10 motion pictures that are $100 million movies, which is very difficult to get today. We got it down to eight and not as much big budget movies. So we're getting more people in. If we get 100 people in there, we have a good chance to get an award. To so have people. an Oscar for the stunt. Yeah, because now we have some power. Right now we only have 40 or 45 guys, and they don't want to hear it. They, don't want, they want to think about their creative art. Well, they don't really know what we do. They now know. these young kids here are falling on their head right now. Someday they're going to be movie makers. That's what we do now. We are creative people, and if they don't think so, bullshit. How many times have they said, hey, Charlie, we're going to do a, a car chase here. Hey, what, what, what ideas do you have? I'm and that's what Corey, sells I the go movie. back again to Starsky and Hutch. When I, I got to know all the people, and that's how I got my break. The director let me direct three shows on the uh, last season. But he would write in the script. The writer would write the story, and they would put, when the action came, to be chore choreographed by the stunt coordinator. Really? And the and chase I would begins. Write, and I would write it all in. I would put, like I do now. And get you know? no credit for it. And I do it all, no computer, do all long hands. Oh. <laughs> so I, I, the, the, the Fall Guy, you worked on, we worked on Hunter together. Fall Guy, I worked on there when Bob Bravo was on it. Uh, then Mickey Gilbert came in. Yeah, I did all that stuff. I did Hill second Street unit. Hill Street Blues. Hill Street Blues. Did a big opening, opening thing on Hill Street Blues, I think the second season. TJ Hooker. TJ, I directed four shows, worked with Bill Shatner, screamed at him a couple of times. Good guy, though. <laughs> yeah. Good guy. Knight Rider? Knight Rider. I did second unit on that and worked on that with Jack. Jack was uh, doing a lot of driving on that. Airwolf. Yeah, Airwolf. This, this, Goes on I'm, only, <laughs> I'm only made a dent in, in his, so far in your resume. I've only, like, just a little time. We could go on for a long, long time here. Part I'm, four, coming up. Hart Castle McCormick, The A-Team, Beverly Hills Cop. We haven't even gotten into the stories the, about Beverly Hills Cop, Gary McCarvey, Eddie Dono. Oh, tell me about the Lethal Weapon franchise. What about you up on the bridge, throwing the truck to the edge of that bridge that with was no cables or nothing? nothing. What were you thinking, nothing. Charlie? What I was thinking then <laughs> was you scared the entire crew. Well, Mick 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 Rogers was co coordinating with me, and he he said, "Don't ever do that again." He was almost crying. I said, "I tell you the honest truth about that." I was always pretty coordinated and doing stuff like that. I knew where I was and I had a good, good vehicle. But as long as you got the good equipment, you can do almost anything. You know that and Steve knows that and Andy. On that particular show, my wife had just gotten in an accident and I didn't really care. No. I just didn't care. No. You're just... It was your, you, you, fought, you felt in, but I, in you know, your heart. The funny thing is I did go, that thing like go. five or six times, right to the edge, it was 80 feet down. I know. Uh, no cables, uh, construction thing where a guy gets off the freeway and goes through all the construction guys and I turn around and come back. And then Mel was coming at me with a motorcycle. But that thing was, um, it was interesting. Matt Sweeney was the effects guy on it. Great guy. Uh, effects guys, you guys should know, and, and when I started out, the effects guys did all 
the rigging. They did it, and you learned a lot from them. You may not know how to put a car cage in, but you know what to look for. As a stuntman, you got to know that. You don't have to weld a car, you don't have to put all that shit in, but you have to know when you go and turn a car over, whether it be just a, off the A-frame or off center, you're gonna go 100 feet. You gotta know the stress that car is gonna take, so you should know about it, not that you have to weld it. So the effects guys were good with that. Today, and a lot of guys have done it maybe past 20 years, stunt guys are rigging, and they're very good. David Huggins and guys like that are fantastic. And riggers become coordinators, so you can, you can make the move from that into, into if, you're good, if you're a good rigger. Kenny Bates did it, he's a really good rigger, not much of a coordinator, but he's a really good rigger. <laughs> <laughs> Look, hey, he knows me and I know him, so yeah, I can say whatever I want about him. You guys love And I've said, it, I've said yeah. it to his face, no, I love him, yeah. but I've said it to his face. But I was gonna say on that show, what was my, my train of thought? Uh, Wait, go back to the bridge for a second, because I not too long ago worked with one of the cops that was there down below and said, <laughs> this man's gonna die. You saw the back end coming around. Yes. Oh, I know what I want to say, go ahead, finish. No, well, this was just like the other day. So this, this, how many years ago did you do that, Lethal Weapon? The Lethal Weapon 20 3 was 92 or 3. And they're still talking about it today. Yeah. About they're how talking about Die Hard today. Dangerous that was that you It was did dangerous. That the guy next to me was a motocross racer, and he actually did something in his pants when I did that. <laughs> <laughs> but the guy on it, just to, to, to tell you how things happened, this was a brand new uh, 250 Ford truck. Great brakes, spin around, perfect. And I did the shot a few times. The first shot coming up on the freeway, in those days we had a big uh, trailer truck and we pulled it around. Matt, uh, uh, Mike Runyard and uh, Johnny Meyer were in a pickup truck and they had a 30 foot cable that pulled the box around. No, like they have now with all those rigs that are fantastic. Well, they pull the box around as I come, all timing, as I come up the ramp, the box is coming right at me. So I got to come and throw a slide and get around it onto the service road and get around it. Then I come into traffic and all that. And as I come around, Johnny, who was passenger, Johnny Meyer, he releases the cable, which gives me a room to get around. So it's pretty tricky. Wow. And we did that. But anyway, my point was that I did the shot many times with different cameras, 25 guys coming at me, Bill Young extras, about 75 coming at me, in and out. I got the old guys choreographed, in and out, in and out, all that stuff. And there's one shot where we had five or six cameras on the truck. Now I had done the thing with the, with the 180 at the, at the freeway. Done that already. Now this was just cameras on the truck and the director wanted to go through traffic. So Matt Sweeney, who was a Baja racer, effects guy, said, can I ride with you? I said, yeah, come on. We get in the car, I get my, my start mark from the service road and I take off and here come the cars at me. And I'm going through and I'm about maybe 20 feet through it. And I, and the brakes went out. No. No brakes at all. I said, Matt, we're down. We have no brakes. So now I'm freewheeling. I'm playing with the emergency brake a little bit, trying to slow down, but I was, I was going pretty good. So I got through it. And so those things happened. If that happened at the bridge, which when you're doing something like that, you're going in at 60 miles an hour, and I come to the doorway, and I'm starting to feather it here, then I lock it off. Well, <laughs> if I'm yeah. feathering it, nothing's there. No. You're going to go off. You're going to you're going to throw that slide no matter what you do, you're going to go and it's going to drift. You're going to go off. You're going to So go these off the things edge. happen and, and people always say what's the most dangerous stunt you've ever done in the business? And you're probably going to come up to that. Well, they're not dangerous until something happens. When something happens, then they become dangerous. What I was going to ask you. <laughs> what's the most dangerous? What's the most no. <laughs> <laughs> no, what's, what's the one movie that you think as a, young, as a young boy or as a young man that you saw that you said to yourself, I want to be a stuntman? What was the thing that influenced Charlie Petrini? I used to love, and, and guys don't know that I'm a pretty good horseman. I rode bareback and I had a horse for 20, two horses for 25 years. Randolph Scott. You remember him? Nobody here remembers him. I know of him. Randolph Scott was a Western guy that was a typical, I mean, a great look. And I, I just, I loved him in Westerns. And a funny thing happened when I get in the business many years later. I love Randolph Scott. My brother was an actor and I'm doing a show with him at CBS. And I go in wardrobe and they, it was a Western show and they said, put those pants on. What do you think they are? I put them on and inside the pants it said expressly made for Randolph Scott. Oh, really? Where do you think they went? You stole them and took them home. <laughs> My bag. <laughs> <laughs> I, had them, I had them for years. I had them with a, a, a canvas. Oh. oh my gosh. Randolph Scott, he was my favorite. Anyway, that was the guy. You know what? 
I'm going to ask you a favor. Go ahead. We, it was, it was, you already asked you a favor to come here and do this once. Will you come Corey, back and do it again? Corey, as long as you have pizza, I'll go anywhere. <laughs> Will you come back and do another Stunt Stories? Yeah, why not? Corey <laughs> Petruni! Well, that's it for this episode of Stunt Stories. I hope you enjoyed it. Mm-hmm.